All right. So this week we're going to talk about stocks and also uh, bonds. So, um, you know, I know a lot of you will may be saying you, you may not ever invest directly in stocks. You know, you, you don't see yourself in the in the stock market itself. I would argue that for most of you, um, you will be involved in stocks, you, maybe not directly, but you'll be buying mutual funds and mutual funds are typically comprised of of stocks they can be mutual funds can get kind of creative and and maybe have some other assets under them maybe some real estate or, or even some bonds but 95 96 whatever high percentage are, are straight vanilla stock funds and that's the reason why is because that's where you know things do well um, the the stock market um, does does quite well it's res returned about roughly 10% um, since the turn of the last century, so 120 some years or whatever. Um, it's, you don't have a whole lot of choice. Now, being in stocks though, you do have to accept that uh, there is gonna be some some volatility. There, There is some risk involved, but risk and return are definitely correlated. If you take no risk at all, um, well, you're taking a great risk, actually, because especially now that inflation's kicking in, your your money will not be able to to buy anything. So there's things you can do to mitigate, you know, the risk. You can do research, or you can um, have somebody else do the research for you by, you know, getting involved in a mutual fund and getting some diversification and hopefully some good guidance. Um, there's crappy mutual funds out there. I mean, just because it's mutual fund doesn't mean it's great. But um, it is kind of easier to find a good management team uh, managing a mutual fund with a good track record. And, uh, you know, anyway, you, you've got some things you can look at. And we'll talk about some of the rating services and things involved. But anyway, mutual funds will be covered in a different different thing. But the, the underlying assets in a mutual fund are typically stocks. And so when I talked about stocks before, stocks are... Uh, uh, equity position you own a chunk of that company so um, let's say the, the company goes bankrupt you know you can't go to the company and say well I want my money back no you are in this together you owned a chunk of the company and and that company that you own a chunk of went out of business so but conversely if that business does well um, you can do quite well and so Anyway, you can you can speculate. You can go for some very aggressive type moves, um, or you can go with with uh, more conservative, uh, well-known companies that may not have the same growth, but uh, may be more appropriate for for your strategic goals. So anyway, how stocks are are traded, how that's all done. You have stock exchanges, and what stock exchanges do is they trade. It's a better better terminology might be the secondary market, right? The primary market would be very rare for you to get involved in as a retail investor. That would be buying directly from the company. Doesn't happen very often. Uh, typically, when you go to buy some, let's say you're going to buy some Coinbase stock or some, you know, Google. Or, I guess it'd actually be Alphabet as a parent company. But anyway, you're going to buy one of those stocks. Um, you are essentially buying stock that's already been issued. Now, not all companies are publicly traded. You know, back a few years ago, um, the preeminent company for for drones, and I probably still is, was DGI. DGI was a Chinese company, which doesn't mean you can't purchase them, but what did happen was at the time they weren't publicly traded. I don't even know the status of the company now, but let's say you, you look at a company, you say, wow, this this is a great product, and you you try to buy part of that company. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but I mean, there's nothing to prevent you from trying to buy it, but in this case, um, you were prohibited from buying it because it was privately held. It was not publicly traded. They hadn't gone out to to try and generate money and sell stock. That's why companies sell stock is because they want capital. They want money to invest, to grow faster than 
could be done if they just waited for their earnings. So anyway, companies also have another way of getting money, and that would be to borrow it, and that would be in the form of a bond. It's very uncommon for a, a large company to get a loan from a bank. Uh, banks at the, the big commercial banks just don't work that way. They don't have those sorts of resources. Those big commercial banks, they organize, you know, the stock sales and, and the institutional money, you know, the pension funds and the, the mutual fund companies and the smaller folks, the retail investors. Anyway, they, they organize those trades, but they don't actually have the resources to typically loan the funds to the companies. So New York Stock Exchange, yeah, it's a it's the biggest um, or most popular, I guess. NASDAQ and some of the other exchanges, because there's this notion of going on the floor, you know, with these guys that are yelling out orders and stuff. That's that's just not, you know, that's for movies and stuff. Now, um, most trading is done electronically. And when you go to trade stocks, if you ever do, you'll see the transactions executed, you know, in seconds. And people will pay um, great sums of money to have their servers you know, fractionally closer to the exchange or wherever that transaction is being executed so that they can pre-run trades and do some other things. But anyway, they're actually the, the speed of light, you know, the speed of electricity, whatever that is, uh, 186,000, whatever the units are, pretty damn quick, um, does make a difference in, in those quick, quick trades. So floor traders, yeah, that's what they're talking about with the guys on the floor, but not so much anymore. Most of it's done electronically. Um, typically, stock transactions submitted through a brokerage form executed by a specialist. Yeah, there's usually not even a man in the loop. Um, most things are done electronically now. American Stock Exchange, a few. NASDAQ is the other big stock exchange, but NASDAQ is is a over-the-counter type of exchange that's not... It, it doesn't necessarily have to have a physical location. So this is what they're talking about here, OTC, Electronic Communication Network. Less stringent risking, uh, listing requirements than New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, I've had companies that were listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and then they, I think they call it a yellow sheet or a pink sheet. Anyway, they can get delisted. So just because they're on the exchange doesn't mean they're going to stay there. But the way stock exchange works, the way prices are set, is for every buyer there's a seller. And so, you know, these people that are sort of the vultures that are trying to swoop in, pick up the good deals, if they weren't there, the price would just continue to descend. So, you know, this is capitalism at its finest. You, you need both sides. You need um, everybody involved so that prices uh, truly reflect what the market will bear. So electronic communication. So again, these guys, they don't quite understand the technology. It's, it's really kind of transparent to you and me. All you know is you go on your brokerage firm, you place your order, and you don't really care a whole lot else. It's not a big, big deal. It's all going to work out in the end. Stock quotations. Quotations, this used to be a bigger deal. This is kind of where Bloomberg got to be big in terms of providing very quick uh, stock quotes and all that. Now, again, with technology, uh, not a huge deal. Anybody who's looking at financial newspapers for it is well behind the power curve. You know, things are done electronically now, and real-time quotes are, are what you act upon. And again, real-time quotes used to you know, basically be sold for a premium. Now, when you go to trade stock, uh, any brokerage will, will give you the real-time price so that you have the best information possible. You know, and, and for for most of us, if you're in a mutual fund situation where you're going to buy and hold, you may not be as worried about the time-critical element. But there are people, you know, day traders and other folks who are, you know, they're they're need those quick accurate quotes and it's, it's a lot of psychology to try and figure out where prices are going and the rest of it here's a sample of a 
you know, kind of an old school stock quotation. Um, and this is, you know, where you're looking at it over the previous day anymore. And I'll show you charts are the way people do it anymore. Charts are, are so much more useful. Um, and again, you don't have to be a subscriber or anything, you know, maybe, you know, Yahoo Finance that I don't use Yahoo for much, but their finance charts are pretty good. Same with Google and, and any brokerage firm. But um, in here, you've got a couple prices. You've got this is this is actually pretty well. No, this is over 52 weeks. So over the course of a year, it's gone from 62 was the high at some point and the lowest it got was 49. Here's the stock. Um, typically, there's a tip ticker symbol that would not be. So they're saying this name of this company is Zoogle, um, whatever, and depends on the company. You know, stock ticker symbols uh, like for Ford Motor, it's just a single F for Shopify. It's shop, you know, and for anyway, different companies can come up with different stock symbols that you typically look them up. But again, with the internet, if you type in the whole company name or you just type in the ticker symbol, uh, that'll be fine. Dividends, yields, price to earning ratio, volume. Volume is nice to have, but again, these, you know, dividends and yields are, are not typically found on charts. It depends what kind of stocks you're, you're investing in, but this would be indicative of an income stock. But volume is nice to know. Uh, close so that's the price that it closed so you can tell it's it's kind of I would dare I say in the toilet because it's the low for the year is 4940 and today it closed at 50 bucks so that's only you know 60 cents off the close and that's up 27 cents so you know the previous day it was almost down to the low so anyway I'll show you a chart here in a second um analyst recommendations that, that the individual broker skills i've been involved with with certain brokers and this was years ago um you know stock brokers and they really weren't worth their their time um pretty much any trade i was involved in was followed up by a letter i'll say six to nine months later saying that there's a class action lawsuit because a brokerage firm that I was working with misrepresented a stock and you know people get upset when they lose money but anyway um, I'm not so interested in a local broker there's there's people at higher levels and generally like subscription type service um, people that you can listen to that that will give you um, better information and you know I I do subscribe to a, a couple different um, folks who, who make stock recommendations and uh, you know they get paid well not by me individually I mean I give them just a small chunk but because they're successful there's a lot of people who subscribe to their services so we can we can look at some of those but uh, yeah the the utility of a broker to execute the transaction um, they're they're not required anymore um, it used to be, you know, any of these brokerages were cause, charged me, you know, seventy, a hundred dollars, something like that for a trade. Now it's free. It's um, in any brokerage, online brokerage that wants to remain competitive, uh, doesn't typically charge commissions. So discount brokerage firms. Well, you can't get any more any more discounted than free some of these full service type people if you're you know a high wealth individual and you've got somebody executing the trades for you that might work out but again there's a whole lot of you know whatever people tend to get their advice from one person and execute the trades themselves or or have that person perhaps execute it but it's it's not a time consuming task there's there's not a whole lot involved to executing a trade anymore with the advent of you know the automated trading systems placing an order so let's look at at one of these charts just because i keep talking around it um let's go in here and look at um Oh, we'll see what pops up. It's probably going to be a Google 
and shop. So came up with Google. This is what I'm talking about with a chart. Um, this is just over a one day and you can see the price was changing throughout the course of the day. Uh, you can see what the high and the low is. If you want to know what the high and the low over the year was, you can do that. And in fact, you can, you know, hold your cursor down and drag it across and it'll tell you what the percentage gain is between those. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge up 560 bucks because it was down low uh, after the COVID thing. Fairly volatile year. Um, let's look at Yahoo Finance since I mentioned that before. Anyway, all the charting things are typically about the same. But if I'm right, I think the Yahoo one actually goes full screen a little quicker. Um, so when we talk about a ticker symbol, like I said, Ford Motor is just an F, right? Not that I have any Ford stock because 16 bucks, that, that doesn't mean that much, but let's look at it over five years. Yeah, you know, it started out at 12.53 and it's at $16. Let's go back and look at what I was talking about before. This is a shop I don't currently, I guess I still have a little bit of it, but not as much. But let's look at it over five years. So you can see that, you know, $42 to 1500 and something. I mean, so anyway, each to his own, but um, different stocks. Here's a different type of chart. You can see that you get a lot more. You got volume across the bottom. Um, you get some information here in terms of uh, what people think in terms of bearish, bullish, um, news included, comparisons. It's just so much more powerful than a than a line quote. Um, they'll compare it to some of the others. They'll tell you what, you know, here's Bitcoin right now, 62,000 ethers at 42. Anyway, um, just so much more information is out there. So... Uh, I'm considering buying some Coinbase tomorrow. It's already up, but it's got momentum. So I typed in the whole name. Actually, the ticker would just be Coin, but I didn't do that because I didn't know what it was. Obviously, it's a new company, so it doesn't have a five-year. It was an IPO, so it just goes the extent of the range. But over the course of the month, I don't know. Could happen, could not. Um, let me see. Well, anyway, there's just a lot more information. You know, this is this is on a free site. Uh, if you're paying for it, uh, it can be quite a bit different. Um, let me show you another site in terms of advice. If you're not real comfortable jumping in and doing this yourself, you can subscribe to a a company and you know that's all these guys do is is offer stock advice I'm actually a member but I'm not gonna jump in and do that but I, I don't trade on them independently I'll look at um, kind of what makes sense and see what they recommend they recommend a lot of stuff that I absolutely wouldn't buy uh, there's probably about oh I don't know 10% of the things they recommend that seem to make logical sense to me and uh, but anyway, if you stick with their record, they're they they do quite well. I mean, S and P, the Standard Poor's 500 is up 140 percent in that period, and they're up 656. So they've got a pretty good track record. You know, that's almost three times the S and P here. This one's quite a few times the S and P. So anyway, different things, and something like this would probably go for I don't know what it is now. It's about 200 bucks a year. But if you're trading a lot of stocks, that might be a way to go. So you're not in on it alone is what I'm trying to say. And this is just one service. There's plenty of other things. There's all kinds of people on the Internet and on YouTube and stuff. But you have to be very careful, especially with some of the, the penny stocks, because what can happen? Let's say this is like Wolf of Wall Street stuff. I've got a position in a company. I want that stock price to go up because I own it. So I get out there on 
you know, Wall Street bets or whatever else. And, and uh, you know, there's some good people on there, but there's also some guys doing pump and dump type things. They'll get out there and try and generate a bunch of hype about a company that they have a position in, trying to get more people involved, trying to rally the price up. And, you know, they're just looking for suckers and then they sell uh, once the price gets up. So anyway, we kind of learned how that works. So, yeah, purchasing, selling the stock, type in the name of the stock. Let's say you have a brokerage account, put in buy or sell, put in the shares. And you don't have to do round lots, odd lots. You can do decimals. You can do dollar amounts. It's all all these old school things where, where buying stocks was difficult. Those have kind of gone away. I don't do Robinhood. I've got other brokerage firms, but I mean, if you, you know, Robinhood, they, they, their business model is to make it very easy and, and very fluid and kind of fun. And it is kind of fun doing some of these other orders, uh, market orders, limit orders, stop orders. I get involved in this to a certain extent. I generally purchase under market orders, which means I want the price that's going for right now. If I see a price, you know, kind of, dithering around a little bit and and i think i can get in let's say the stock price is like 52 dollars, but i've seen it you know within the day trading down as low as 49 and i don't have the patience to sit there and watch it i could put in a limit price to buy when it hit 49 now if it goes the other direction um i'm i'm left behind if it never touches that price again i my order will never be executed if you put in our market order it gets executed at the price you've got and then stop orders. I did this quite a bit um, about a month ago. I put in stop orders and basically everything I had. And what I did was I, I put in a trailing stop, which I, well, I guess I got to discuss it right now. What you can do, let's say a, a price is going up, a stock's going up. Let's say it, it goes to $100 and, and you think it's going to go to 110 or 120 but, you know, you don't, you, 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 you bought it for, let's say, $80, and you don't want it to perhaps go, you know, trail back down to that $80 price. So, uh, you know, you, you don't want to get so greedy, but you don't necessarily want to sell it right now because you, you've you got a suspicion it may go up. So what you do is, let's say it's it trades for 105 or 110 now, you put in a trailing stop, which at at let's say a hundred dollars meaning that if that price um continues to go up it goes at 115 120 well your trailing stop is is at a hundred so it never touches that hundred dollars so that stock never gets sold and and you could go ahead and adjust that um stock order um again as needed to to move it on up and so that way, you know that if you're correct, you know, you're going to make some money. And if you're incorrect, if the price descends and hits that $100, well, then your your $100 order, when it hits $100, becomes a market order and gets executed probably pretty close to that $100. What I did was I used a trailing stop, which is a stop order. It's just a variation of it. But what it does is every time... Um, the stock price sets a new high, the trailing stop ratchets up behind that price. So in the case I did it, I just picked an arbitrary number. I, well, it wasn't quite arbitrary, but uh, I had a method to it, but I picked 13%. And so what um, my order became was if, if the stock descended to by 13% off of its high price, um, my stock sold. If the price went up, well, then it established a new a new high, and my trailing stop followed it. the The trailing stop now was higher because it stayed 13% off of that highest price. A trailing stop will never go lower. If the price starts to come down, um, the trailing stop does not move until it actually hits that trailing stop and that order is executed. So 
I was hoping the market was going to go up, but I wasn't very confident. So I put a pretty tight trailing stop in there and just decided that I'd suck it up and sell at 13% off of the high. And, and I'd be fine with that, which I was. Yeah, cause it's very hard to do market time and then figure out where the highs and the lows are going to be um, real time. So that's what you can do. Um, stop order. So we had execute transaction when it reached a specified level. And then a stop order. Uh, buy stop. So you can use buy or sell stop orders as well. And place in an order online, low commission. So they're acting like this is an option. This is pretty much the way things are done. And low as in zero. Um, pretty much any brokerage firm that you want to deal with now uh, offers commission-free trading. So that would include Fidelity, Ameritrade, Schwab, E-Trade. I don't know of anybody who's charging commissions because they would lose all their customers because most of the brokerage firms have gone to no commission. Buying stock on margin. This is called leveraging. This is called a number of things. But there's certain things where we talked about using credit, you know, when credit is smart. Um, in, in buying stocks, it's pretty speculative, very risky to be buying on margin. Um, what you're doing is you're using borrowed money, okay? And so um, the Federal Reserve, you know, the government basically limits that you can only buy um, you know use 50% margin so if you want to buy um, 100 shares of something well you need to pay cash for at least 50 and the other ones you can have on credit the problem you run into here is that you must maintain that 50% and what happens <clears throat> let's say the price starts to descend. Well, that means that your collateral has also started to descend. You, you, that 50% stock um, that that was your original collateral, it was valued in in stock. It was translated into a cash value for the amount of money you borrowed. Um, now, since the stock you own is not as valuable as it was before, you need to come up with some money to maintain that 50% margin because the margin is measured in dollars. And so anyway, they call that a margin call and uh, you would get a, you know, some sort of notification that you need to put up more money. If you're unable to put up more money, then the stock is sold. Um, you couldn't make margin. People do this in crypto as well. And that's where some of these guys, now granted they, they you know, get stopped out very quickly because the tolerances are so tight on in the crypto market because the potential to lose is so high. But anyway, that's a bit beyond uh, this discussion. But if, if anybody advocates you as a, as a you know, other than a speculator, other than a hedge fund guy buying stocks on margin. Um, yeah, that's probably not not something you should do. So margin call, request from a broker to increase the cash in the account in order to bring the margin back up to the minimum level. So anyway, it, it can get kind of nasty. So I've never bought stocks on margin, and uh, I can't really foresee when, when I'd want to do that. Short selling a stock, this was kind of the, uh, again, they're jumping right into pretty advanced concepts here. But this is what happened with all the, the meme stocks and the GameStop and the AMC and all those other things. Where I did do this one time, and I did it with Tesla, which is funny. Um, you know, Tesla is at an all-time high right now. But uh, just after the uh, election, it was when Trump got elected. I shorted Tesla, uh, figuring that the uh, uh, all the incentives and all the uh, free money that was coming Tesla's way uh, from the previous administration would would be depleted and uh, Tesla stock would suffer a little bit. So 
what you do is you you buy stock with a promise to pay for it later and when you pay for it later you're going to pay for it at the current price when you when you pay for it so you, let's say tesla is trading for oh, i think it's trading for five or six hundred at the time and i um shorted it and my anticipation was that when i went to repurchase this stock uh it was going to be uh, at a lower price but anyway i, I could go through uh, uh a graphic example to kind of show you on paper how this works but again it's it's a little more complex than what you're going to be getting into and even most of the mutual funds you're dealing with um, there'll be a thing called a prospectus that you have to sign and agree to and it's kind of the rules that the uh, that the mutual fund manager has to go by and and typically they're prohibited from from uh, doing short selling uh, under most mutual funds. Anyway, it, as you saw in the uh, whole Wall Street bets and and AMC, that it can <laughs> it can work out very well or very poorly depending on on uh, how the market turns for you. So analyzing stocks, technical analysis, historical price patterns. There are some people who basically could lock themselves in a the closet. They don't look at what's going on with the with the stocks at all all they want to know is is what's happened with the charts and they're looking for patterns in a chart and i'm kind of a true believer in that kind of technical analysis when it comes to crypto type stuff but not so much in stocks um in stocks companies there, there's market conditions there's there's the products the company's putting out there's so many other variables but in, in crypto, it does tend to follow um, chart dynamics, which are really just kind of a, a mirror image of human psychology, the way people jump in and jump out of things. Fundamental analysis, that's looking at, at the company and, and what, it's, what it's doing, what its competitors are doing. What's, you know, stocks are always future looking. You're... you're you're concerned with what the health of the company is now, but you're concerned with what it's going to be doing in the future. So a lot of times a combination of the two will work, but I definitely in stocks, I tend to uh, favor fundamental and, and in crypto, since you're not dealing with a company, I definitely tend to favor technical analysis. Firms, financial conditions, a lot of stuff, unless we're, you know, unless that's going to be our gig, unless you're going to be, you know, uh, somebody in depth in the market, um, you're usually going to be looking to somebody else to provide that information, you know, whether it be other advisors or somebody else, you, you want to definitely maybe check their work, but, but to look at a single company and balance sheet and try and get information to decipher it, it can be pretty tough. I'm always involved in growth stocks and growth stocks, you know, typically are losing money because they're growing. They're, they're Amazon lost money for years and years because it was, you know, very future looking. So anyway, um, I'm not saying to, to disregard it, but it, it has to, let me roll this thing back. So balance sheet, firm's condition. Yep. But there's other variables, sometimes the overall economy, sometimes inflation, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of things that can affect a stock price. Accounting fraud, accounting fraud, there'll, there'll be another scandal at some point. Um, people are going to lie and cheat because there's, there's money involved. Um, economic growth, you know, some of these economic conditions, that's why I'm kind of had pulled back from a lot of the market action till things sort of stabilize here over the course of the next month the gdp gross domestic product tells how you know all the goods and services produced within the country physical pol fiscal policy um often translated by the by the fed but you know the effect of taxes and uh 
you know, this all these budget bills that are taking place right now will definitely affect things. Impact of international economies, the financial situation with the real estate companies in China it looked like it was going to have a more major effect, but um, again, the Standard Poor's 500 set in all-time highs, and the Evergrande and, and some of these other companies over there are are definitely struggling, so it's not as significant. The U.S. economy, just because it's more of an open economy, and we still have the dollar and all that, um, it, it does have probably a bigger effect than the, than the Chinese market. Interest rates. Stocks perform when interest rates are low, stocks more sensitive. So things that are happening right now really shouldn't be happening because of inflation, but we'll have to see what happens. The Fed has pretty much used every tool they have, and interest rates are going to have to start to climb. So we'll see what happens. All these negative things, though, that's why Bitcoin is screaming, screaming up. Bitcoin is, in my mind anyway, is, is uh, starting to replace, well, has replaced gold as a store of wealth. So we'll see what happens. You all are probably more into crypto than, than certainly more than my generation. And, and that's a good thing. That's why I'm in crypto, because the people who were into gold and things like that, as they move on, pass away, and turn over their wealth to the next generation, I don't see it going into gold. So I'm, I'm pretty uh, pretty bearish on gold. So inflation. Keep talking about this. The consumer price index. The inflation, it's, it's in the government's best interest to definitely try to understate inflation. Not only for, you know, keeping... Uh, um, you know, consumers and voters happy, but also because there's a whole bunch of things like military retirements and government salaries that are all have a inflation index. So it gets much more expensive for the government to operate. Plus with the amount of debt we have, the loan servicing, the, the amount it takes to repay that debt goes up drastically. So it's not a rosy picture right now. Industry conditions. So supply chain issues it's just a very complex situation but stock market's booming there there's some people who've done super well you know some of the richest folks have doubled their wealth throughout the covid crisis and the bottom tiers have not so it's not uh, there's a lot of turmoil right now so factors that increase the stock price so again, you know, none of this, this is all fundamental analysis. A chart guy, he doesn't even look at this. He's just looking at patterns. Now, patterns may repeat themselves and may reflect some of this data, but this is, you know, when you look at the economy, the interest rates, inflation, and just the company itself, um, that's a huge, huge impact. Limitations of stock analysis. Yeah. It, trying to guess where stocks are going to go can be exceedingly difficult. You'll see a, a bad economic report come out, bad job numbers, bad whatever, and the stock market goes up. And, and it seems completely nonsensical. But you have to keep in mind that it's all psychology and that people are, are guessing which direction it was going to go. And so if the jobs numbers come out, you know, 5% lower, well, maybe the analysts were expecting them to come out 10% lower, so they're actually happy. It's only when there's a, a shock or a um, unknown information, when, when new information has come to light, that's when people get a little nervous. So that's just a brief overview of stocks. They do kind of get in the weeds. I'll, I'll try to give you some of the more useful things. I think they're they're talks about um, well the, the talk about the different types of orders that can be quite useful and that is kind of a compelling argument to, to trade individual stocks because you can't necessarily do that with mutual funds mutual funds are settled out at the end of the day there can be some huge trend taking place and you got to ride it out till the end of the day if you're in mutual funds but mutual funds are not meant to be traded you know quickly 
stocks are. So that's why there's some different rules. So bonds. So this is where a company wants to get money, but they don't want to dilute their, their ownership position. They want to keep it all, and they just want to get a loan. So, um, again, they're not going to go to a, a bank um, to, to get the money. Now, they go may go to the bank to organize the bond sale. But what they're going to do is they're going to um, get money from investors, and the, then they'll pay them, pardon me, uh, an interest rate uh, for using the money. And so the interest rate is based upon the market. You know, if they can pay you 2%, they will, but they wouldn't sell any bonds at 2% right now. So they'll pay 3 or 5%. And finally, anyway, they'll, they'll set up some interest rate that makes them attractive enough to where people will buy them. And so it's just kind of like the stock market in that case where the bond rates go up and down based upon, um, you know, the number of people who are willing to buy the bond. And so long-term debt security, it can be issued by, you know, government or a corporation. Par value, not a big deal. That's the number, well, let's say, you know, a $20,000 bond, the, the par value would be the 20000 So you give this company $20,000, um, they give you your $20,000, say it's a 20-year bond, they give you your $20,000 back at the end of that time at the end of 20 years and and you know basically rent for your money the interest they're going to pay you is going to be a uh, you know that's going to be your your interest rate that you're paid so that's why you're doing it and that's that number that can be uh, you know not necessarily variable but it'll be driven by the markets um, so they make the interest payments and then they repay the money to you Call feature, not a good thing for you. This is where, let's say, you know, they're having a tough time selling bonds. So they say we're going to pay 6% interest. And then let's say interest rates in the economy, you know, are reduced. And all of a sudden they can sell new bonds at only 5%. Well, they're going to send sell new bonds at 5%, get that money, and then exercise their call feature and give you your money back and retire that bond. So, not a good thing for you. Convertible bond, where they can be traded in the stock. Anyway, um, for the longest time, interest rates have been quite low. And so, the attractiveness of bonds has been quite low. Um, so, I don't currently hold any bonds. And, and they aren't that attractive of investment to, to most people right now. Uh, what can happen here is you can trade bonds beforehand. You know, let's say you don't have to keep it for 20 years. But let's say uh, you buy a bond and it's paying 6%, right? Well, let's say interest rates did happen to go down. And new bonds are being sold at, at only paying 5%. And there is no call feature. They're not calling the bond. So you're going to continue to get that 6%. Well, if you wanted to sell that bond to somebody, you can get more than your more than that par value that you paid for it. That bond, if you put it on the market, you might be able to get, say, 21000 22000 You can sell it for more than, than you want. You sell it on the secondary market. Conversely, though, the situation we've had lately is that interest rates are quite low. So let's say you buy a bond, and this is why I don't have any bonds. Uh, let's say you buy a bond and it's paying, you know, 2%, a yield of 2%. And all of a sudden, interest rates start going up, inflation starts going up, and the new bonds, they need to sell them at 3% or 4% or even higher. Well, when you go to sell your bond, if you wanted to sell in the secondary market, people might only give you, you know, fifteen, sixteen thousand for it. And so you got a couple options. You can either suck it up and sell it for that price, or you can be stubborn. You can say, Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get my whole twenty grand back and I'll I'll ride it out and I'll keep it for all twenty years. You know, 
and suck it up and, and lose out on that on the better prevailing interest rate that it, that currently exists. So anyway, that's why I'm not buying bonds right now because I just like everybody else expect interest rates to go up since they have been so low and that any bonds you buy today will probably not be, um, you know, you probably won't be able to sell them for what you paid for them. So and that's that secondary market. Yep goes back through the same brokerage system that you probably bought it through. Now when they start getting into bonds, so obviously government agencies can't sell stock, you know, they can't sell portions of, you know, government facilities. That's that's not the way the government works. What they can do though is they can sell government bonds. Now the reason why some people might be interested in this is because there's such low risk involved. You know, it's one thing for a company to fail, but the government, when they have access to, you know, the printing presses can just print more money or tax people more or whatever. You know, governments typically don't go out of business. They don't fail. And when they do, you know, it's a, it's a very, very big deal. So anyway, the, the, prospect of those guys failing is, is almost nil. So the interest rates are going to pay you are typically quite, quite low. Now there's also some local municipalities can sell like school bonds and other bonds for, uh, you know, paying some of those things. Anyway, sometimes those can be tax free. So that might be a reason why people want to do it because they're looking for a way to, to avoid some taxes. So they'll They'll buy a tax-free muni, a tax-free municipal bond to uh, help their tax situation. And there's a muni. Low risk, interest exempt from federal. And then other Fed bonds. But again, the interest rates on these are not going to keep up with inflation in the best of times in the inflation that we're undergoing now they're they're a joke um, but anyway I mean it's a it's a place to perhaps park your money but it's not really an investment you're not you're not you any amount of money that you're you're making is being well outdone by inflation corporate bonds so this is what you know what I was talking about before were big companies They'll look at either selling stock or they'll issue bonds. And corporate bonds, especially from big companies, can be quite a good investment. Um, but they can also be, you know, junk bonds. The the scale, the rating people who uh, rate bonds, um, they quickly get into a situation where some of these companies have a high likelihood of not paying their bonds back. And so they're going to have to pay a very high interest rate because you're enduring quite a bit of risk. And, you know, if you're buying it, um, well, the salesman is probably going to call it a high yield bond. But, you know, if somebody's evaluating, it's probably going to call it junk because there's a high likelihood of them not paying it or they're just going to default and you're stuck. Um you know, since it is a bond, you do have recourse against the company if the company's still going. But companies that issue junk bonds are typically failing anyway. So you're not in a much better position than if you had, you know, stock and actually owned a chunk of it. So the numbers you're looking at that are, you know, coupon rates, maturities, current yields, volumes. And again, you can get charts for these, but it's not as critical. Um, they, there's only a few numbers you're looking at typically on bonds but here's a, a quote you know paying a five percent yield maturity price of 100 bucks volume impact of interest rates so I already spoke to this if the interest rate rises the value of bond decreases because new bonds are going to be issued at a higher rate nobody wants your low paying bond if interest rates fall well we came out of a period where they were exceedingly low, um, so it's not very likely they can't fall, you know, below zero. So the value of your bond uh, would increase, but not a likely scenario. 
Tax implications of bonds. Yep, tax is ordinary income. And then, of course, if you sell that $20,000 bond for, you know, $22,000, it's just a capital gain as if it were stock or anything else. Time value of money. You can use those same types of charts to figure out the, you know, the attractiveness of the bond. So this might be a case where you'd look in there and you'd, you'd see what those series of payments equate to. Risk from investing in bonds. So two types of risk here. Yeah, default risk that they won't repay. And then the risk premium to compensate for the risk of default. So if it's a government bond, there's not going to be much of a risk premium because they typically don't uh, default. But um, there's the risk of competitive investments going up and down. So different people will, will rate them. Moody's, Standard & Poor's, uh, both those, you know, what you're looking at is a third-party agency rather than the company itself telling you about the quality of the bond. And so there's, you know, quite a bit of grade inflation here. You know, bonds are rated triple A. And when you get down to like an, a B bond is, is almost junk. So it's, it's um, you know, B doesn't sound bad. C is bad. Impact of the financial crisis. Yep, companies can go under. Informations are weak. Yep. So you can see anything B, a double B below that is junk. So Moody's has a slightly different scale, but not too awful different. So if you're buying these bonds down here, you, you could be getting, you know, 20% interest until you don't get it. And then the likelihood of getting your, your, you know, that par value back, that, that money you lent them back, you may only have those few months of interest payments before the company goes under. So they don't offer huge interest rates because they want to. It's because they have to because they aren't very attractive because they're such low quality. So the call, we talked about that, where they call the bond and then the interest rate risk some people will have the maturity set up I mean you can you can look if you're interested in bonds uh, you can set it up on a you know sort of a strategic profile for when they will mature and when you get your your big chunk of money back that you loan them so you know you could set it up for your children's education if you wanted to you know a 20-year bond maybe a little shorter than that if the child was just born this is where the gamesmanship comes in it's it has to do with forecasting about which way you think the interest rates are going to go. Right now, it's kind of a no-brainer. They're going to go up. And here, they're just going to suck it up. They're going to go for a longer period of time where they don't think interest rate is going to be such a big deal. Yep, so they went with the college education example that I was talking about. All right, so that's that's about it. Like I say, I'm I don't pretend to be a an expert in bonds, and I'm not going to try and be a huge advocate for bonds. I will, you know, kind of advocate for for stock market just because, um, you know, inflation and and other investments are maybe not going to do it for you. You know, precious metals, golds and silver and things like that don't really generate the income um, real estate is a is a great investment um, but again a combination of the two is probably where you're going to end up with um, most of you 
will probably be working for a firm at some point. You may be self-employed, but if you're working for a big company and you've got a, a 401k and all the rest of that, you're going to typically end up in mutual funds, which will typically be comprised of stock portfolios. So it's important that you understand stocks and, and we'll talk about mutual funds. I think probably in the next lecture, we'll, we'll go in a little bit more and I'll give you a kind of a few more, you know, insights into it, but it's, it's not necessarily gambling. If you're gambling, you're speculating, but there, there's ways to take a lot of that gamble out of it, a lot of that speculation out of it and bring it back into the realm of, you know, predictable investments. And it has to do with, you know, setting realistic goals and, and 10% is typically what you can get without a lot of speculation. So anyway, we'll talk more about that on the next lecture.